As you start to build more and more services on top of Kubernetes, simple tasks start to get more complicated. For example, teams can't create services or deployments with the same name. If you have thousands of pod, just listing them all would take some time, let alone actually administering them. And these are just the tip of the iceberg. In this episode of Kubernetes Best Practices, let's take a look at how namespaces can make managing Kubernetes resources easier. So what exactly is a namespace? You can think of a namespace as a virtual cluster inside your Kubernetes cluster. You can have multiple namespaces inside a single Kubernetes cluster, and they're all isolated from each other. They can help you and your teams with organization, security, and even performance. In most Kubernetes distributions, the cluster comes out of the box with the namespace called default. In fact, there are actually three namespaces that Kubernetes ships with, default, Cube system and Cube public. Cube public really isn't used for much right now, and it's usually a good idea to leave Cube system alone, especially in a managed system like Google Kubernetes Engine. This leaves the default namespace as the place where your services and apps are created. There's absolutely nothing special about this namespace, except that the Kubernetes tooling is set up out of the box to use this namespace, and you can't delete it. While it's great for getting started, and smaller production systems, I would recommend against using it in large production systems. This is because it's very easy for a team to accidentally overwrite or disrupt another team without even realizing it. Instead, you should create multiple namespaces and use them to segment your services into manageable chunks. Creating a namespace can be done with a single command. If you want to create a namespace called test, you would run kubectl create namespace test. Or you could create a YAML file and apply it just like any other Kubernetes resource. You can see all the namespaces with the following command, kubectl get namespace. You can see the three built-in namespaces as well as the new namespace called test. Let's take a look at a simple YAML to create a pod. You may notice that there's no mention of a namespace anywhere. If you run kubectl apply on this file, it'll create a pod in the current active namespace. This will be the default namespace unless you change it. Now there's two ways to explicitly tell Kubernetes which namespace you want your resource created in. The first way is using the namespace flag when creating the resource. The second way is to specify a namespace in the YAML declaration. Now if you specify a namespace in the YAML, the resource will always be created in that namespace. If you try to use another namespace by using the namespace flag, the command will fail. Now, if you try to find your pod, you might notice you can't find it. This is because all commands are run against a current active namespace. To find your pod, you need to use the namespace flag. Now, this can get annoying quickly, especially if you're a developer working on a team that uses its own namespace for everything and don't want to use the namespace flag for every single command. Let's see how we can fix that. Out of the box, your active namespace is the default namespace. Like we saw before, unless you specify a namespace in the resources YAML, all Kubernetes commands will use the active namespace. Now, unfortunately, trying to manage an active namespace with kubectl can be a pain. Fortunately, there's a really good tool called kubens that makes it a breeze. When you run the kubens command, you should see all the namespaces with the active namespace highlighted. To switch your active namespace to the test namespace, you can just run kubens test. Now you can see the test namespace is active. If you run kubectl commands, the namespace will now be test instead of default. This means you don't need the namespace flag to see the pod in the test namespace. So namespaces are hidden from each other, but they're not isolated. A service in one namespace can talk to a service in another namespace pretty easily. This can often be very useful, for example, having your service for your team talk to another namespace with another team service. Normally, when your app wants to access a Kubernetes service, you can just use the built-in DNS service discovery and just point your app at the service's name. However, you can create a service with the same name in multiple namespaces. Thankfully, it's easy to get around this by using the expanded form of the DNS address. Services in Kubernetes expose their endpoint using a common DNS pattern. It looks like this. 
Normally, you just need the service's name and DNS will automatically resolve to the full address. However, if you need to access a service in another namespace, just use the service name plus the namespace name. For example, if you want to connect to the database service in the test namespace, you can use the following address, database.test. And if you want to connect to the database service in the prod namespace, you can use the following address, database.prod. Of course, sometimes you do want to isolate and limit access to a namespace. Kubernetes lets you do this with network policies. Stay tuned for a future episode where we'll deep dive into these. A common question I get is how many namespaces to create and for what purpose? What exactly is a manageable chunk? If you make too many namespaces, they'll just get in your way. But if you make too few, you'll lose the benefits. I think there are four major stages that each company goes through and they have their own organizational structure. Depending on the stage that your project or company is in, you can adopt the relevant namespace strategy. So imagine you're part of a small team that's working on maybe five to 10 microservices and you can easily bring everyone into the same room. In this situation, it makes sense to launch all production services into the default namespace. You might want to have a production and development namespace if you want to get fancy, but you know, you're probably testing your development environment on your local machine using something like Minikube. Now the scenario changes. You have a rapidly growing team that's working on 10 or more microservices. It's necessary at this point to use multiple clusters or namespaces for production and development. You may start to split the team into multiple subteams that each have their own microservices, and then each of these teams may choose their own namespace for easier manageability. While everyone might know how the complete system works, it's getting harder and harder to coordinate every change with everyone else. Trying to spin up the full stack on your local machine is just getting more complicated every day. Now at large companies, everyone doesn't know everyone else. Teams are working on features that other teams might not even know about. Now teams are communicating using service contracts and maybe they're using service meshes like Istio to coordinate communication. Trying to run the whole stack locally is just impossible. Using a Kubernetes aware uh, CD system like Spinnaker is highly recommended. And at this point, each team definitely needs their own namespace. Each team might even opt for multiple namespaces to run their development and production environments. Setting up RBAC and resource quotas is a good idea as well, and we'll cover those in future episodes. Multiple clusters start to make sense at this point, but they really might not be necessary. And finally, there are large enterprise companies. There are groups that don't even know about the existence of other groups. Groups might as well be external companies, and services are consumed through well-documented APIs. Each group has multiple teams that have multiple microservices. Using all the tools I previously mentioned are necessary, and people should not be deploying services by hand, and in fact, they should be locked out of namespaces they don't own. At this point, it probably makes sense to have multiple clusters to reduce the blast radius of poorly configured applications and to make billing and resource management easier. As the number of microservices and teams using Kubernetes in your organizations increases, namespaces can really make Kubernetes a lot more manageable and give you increased control, security, and flexibility. I'll see you on the next episode of Kubernetes Best Practices.